Hey there, planet Earth. What's up? Today on Science Epics Literature Review, we take a look at Persepolis Rising by James S.A. Corey. This is the seventh book in the Expanse series, and man, I love the Expanse. My life has not been the same since I watched the TV show, and I recommend you guys out there to just watch the TV show. The new season is coming out, season four. In December 2019, I'm super excited. Ah, I love The Expanse. The depth and realism of this sci-fi universe is incredible. Every time I watch the TV show, I feel like I want to jump into the screen and just be a part of that amazing future universe set 200 years from now. The Expanse is set 200 years in the future in a setting where the entire solar system has been colonized all the way out to the asteroid belt and there are three distinct societies that live within it. There are the Earthers represented by the UN government and they are the waning power in the solar system. Their ships are old and slow but they have a lot of them and most Earthers live off of basic government assistance. Then there are the Martians, led by the Mars Congressional Republic, or MCR, which is a very emo name for a government. Wink, wink. And they are actually pretty emo because their culture is very militaristic and semi-fascistic because at any moment, the juggernaut of the United Nations from Earth might come over and annihilate them for whatsoever reason. And the dream of the Martian people is to terraform Mars to become more Earth-like in our century because the Earth in their time period is really messed up, has a very messed up environment because of global warming. And then there's this third society called the Belters and they live in the asteroid belt among rocky bodies such as Ceres and Eros and they are represented by the Outer Planets Alliance and you can think of the Belters as like the Syrians and the Kurds of today because they're always oppressed. Mars and Earth are always trying to take their stuff. There's a lot of resources in the asteroid belt like water, ice, and even in the rings of Saturn. A lot of ice harvesting is done in, in the asteroid belt. And Mars and Earth are in a race competition to acquire those resources and they kind of trample over the belters in order to get them. And they're also similar to the Kurdish people this OPA, Outer Planets Alliance, because they're, they consist of multiple disparate, loosely affiliated groups, some of which may be borderline terrorist organizations and others um, maybe you can work with, like the YPG, the PKK. And that's sort of what the OPA is like. Now, the Belters spend most of their lives in near weightless environments, and their human physiology is greatly affected by it. Since their bone and muscle mass are affected by life in zero G, they are all very tall and lanky people. But their culture is very rich and they have a very interesting and unique heart and soul to Belter culture. And I think that's very interesting. Now the main story in The Expanse involves this incredible transformational journey of war, sex and politics a la Game of Thrones that this three-nation space-faring civilization goes through via contact with this mysterious alien technology from out of the solar system called the protomolecule. Ooh, scary. But really, it's this awesome, fun, and thought-provoking space adventure. I suggest you watch the TV series that was renewed for its fourth season that will be coming out in about a week. From now as of recording this and the fourth season was picked up by Amazon Prime thank the stars that it didn't end up like Firefly cut off suddenly and we will see more of the expanse and since Amazon Prime is owned by Jeff Bezos who also owns his own aerospace company Blue Origin that is attempting to get to the moon he's using the expanse as a way of selling outer space exploration to promote his business and improve his income and revenue and ultimately to bring forward that future where mankind expands outwards 
to the solar system. It's like a synergy of science fiction and science and industry in a way that is incredibly unique to this age that we live in. This book, Persepolis Rising, is the seventh book in the series. In total, there are nine books, eight of which have been released so far. The latest one came out earlier this year, in 2019. Now, all of the books have these amazing epic titles like Leviathan Wakes or Abaddon's Gate or Tiamat's Wrath, which are all subtly related to the events happening inside the book. And this one is called Persepolis Rising. And Persepolis is a reference to the capital of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. So this book is detailing the rise of a great empire called the Laconian Empire, who are supposed to be the big bad antagonists throughout the novel. Now the word antagonist is quite subjective in The Expanse because The Expanse is not really a story about one particular person or one particular evil emperor, even though the book does follow different individual POV characters in their own personal struggles. The Expanse tells the story of groups of people and societies. It's a sociological sci-fi drama. Think of Isaac Asimov's Foundation series or Chixin Liu's Three-Body Problem. It's about the progress and interaction of society in a science fiction setting. And what The Expanse does well is telling how real it is. It keeps things 100. It keeps things Ben Frank. And we like to think that as human civilization expands outwards to the stars, that we will eventually learn to play nice with each other since the amount of space that we could go out to is nearly endless. There would be no shortage of room out there and we would thus be able to let go of our limiting mindsets and open ourselves up to a universe of possibilities and finally achieve utopia. Well, contrary to that, we might actually just go out there and carry the same old hubris and baggage that we had on our planet, but just on a totally different level. But with planet-destroying nuclear weapons this time, it's totally plausible. And stories like The Expanse provide a cautionary tale to show that short of the threat of complete annihilation by an unknown alien aggressor, that human beings will continue to oppress one another in one way, shape, or form. It's a tale as old as time. War. War never changes. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I was on a road trip reading this novel, and these Laconian guys, this Laconian empire was gearing up to prepare to invade the solar system, and they were making battle plans and thinking of conquest like it was nothing, like it was their quote-unquote, duty and destiny to take over the solar system. And I was thinking to myself as I was reading it, it's like, you guys can't be serious. And by the end of the novel, when the invasion had ended and when the dust had settled, I was subdued by the whole thing, thinking that, yep, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Good job, humanity, y'all done fucked it up again. That's my best impression of a Mariner Valley southern drawl martian accent it turns out that in in the world of the expanse in the future that mars is colonized mostly by texans and chinese people well the chinese thing is to be expected because being the red planet and red is a very lucky color in chinese culture so it's pretty evident why chinese people would want to move there but anyway Persepolis Rising takes place 30 years after the last novel, Babylon's Ashes. And the solar system is at a time of relative peace, which is something that hadn't happened in a while. Then this Laconian Empire comes along and flips the table. And how they do this is rather incredible, actually. And it involves that mysterious proto-molecule that I told you about. Reverse engineering this proto-molecule allows them to do some game-breaking OP shit. They invent these ships called the Pulsar and Blazar battlecruisers that are unlike any other ship humanity has ever seen before. They look like fish swimming around in space and they have this self-regenerating plate hull armor and this incredibly 
powerful magnetic beam weapon that just rips apart enemy ships into molecular kibble in an instant. And this single ship, one of these ships just wipes the floor with anything that it faces. Entire fleets of the Earth-Mars coalition and these massive weaponized space colonies called void cities that the Belters build. <laughs> it's funny because I actually study pulsars as part of my radio astronomy postgraduate course. And pulsars are magnetized neutron stars that emit beams of electromagnetic radiation along their magnetic axes. And they can be found within the heart of supernova remnants. Pulsars can be found within the heart of supernova remnants, the cloudy debris left behind by exploded giant stars. Pulsars produce a pulsar wind nebula that sounds to me a lot like what the Laconian ships are using to inflict damage on their enemies. Pulsar wind nebulas are these fast traveling relativistic magnetized winds that are emitted by the pulsar and when they crash against the cold interstellar medium produces what is called a bow shock nebula. If you look up pictures of the Vela and Crab Pulsar, you will see these shockwave-like structures within the supernova remnant surrounding the central pulsar, and those are produced by magnetic pulsar winds. <laughs> Perhaps all these signals that radio astronomers thought were coming from magnetized neutron stars are actually the result of battles between ships equipped with protomolecule technology, and that the universe is actually a dark forest, rife with routine interplanetary violence. The phrase routine interplanetary violence was originally coined by Carl Sagan when the comet Shoemaker-Levy crashed into Jupiter in 1993, but in this case, the violence is all man-made. More on the dark forest later. We'll be reviewing Chixin Liu's Death's End after this. Now, this ship class imbalance between Laconia and the Earth-Mars coalition is one of the things that kind of trips me out about Persepolis Rising after having watched the TV series. I'm pretty familiar with the strategic picture of the Expanse. Now, there's this one scene in season three, I believe, and I recommend you guys watching it, is when Earth tries to take out the Martian first strike nuclear capability using their planetary railguns. And it's all levels of Tom Clancy 11th hour tense in the Situation Room. It's like something that could plausibly happen today with nuclear weapons. And that's the kind of realism that the series was going for before. And then to read about how just one ship, one of these Pulsar and Blazar battle cruisers just inexorably subdues an entire solar system, although is awesome in its scale of action, kind of breaks the suspension of disbelief for me at times. You know, it's why the more refined among us prefer Battletech over Gundam and Gundam over Super Robot Wars because of that added depth and realism. By this time in this series, Book 7, Earth and Mars are working together instead of warring with each other, like in the first few books. Now, the militaries of Earth and Mars had pretty much refined stellar warfare to an art and combined together with these big belter void cities, they get pub stomped all the way from Pluto to Terra by a single ship. And that is quite hard to believe in my opinion. I guess the authors are trying to portray the proto molecule as a sort of MacGuffin technology where anything can happen. Space bends, time warps, and yes, Time actually warps because of that magnetic beam weapon and that introduces a whole slew of other problems like, like freaking aliens showing up and the energy of empty space boiling over to produce gamma rays. One important thing to remember in science fiction is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And one of the first mind-boggling, mind-blowing moments in Persepolis Rising for me happened as a pretty trivial event, actually. It was the moment that convinced me to stick around for the rest of the novel. You see, in this universe, 
In the Expanse universe, humanity is connected to other star systems by a network of ring gates to 1300 distant worlds. Humanity did not build the network, but inherited it from an ancient, long-dead alien civilization. And scattered throughout these 1300 worlds are different types of mysterious technological artifacts left behind by the alien civilization that built the ring gates. And no one knows what any of that shit does, homie. One of those artifacts are these weird little seed pods that, when connected together in a ring, produce colorful visuals that have the same effects as a psychedelic experience. None of the human explorers have any idea what it's for. It could have been the weapon that was responsible for wiping out the alien civilization, or it could have been an alien toothbrush for all the explorers knew, and that really blew my mind. And they're just hauling these artifacts back to the solar system for further study, even though they don't really know what it's for. Now imagine what Europeans living in the year 700 felt like when they looked at a Roman aqueduct, but it's even far stranger than that. You don't know how it works, you don't know how to build one yourself, but in this case you don't even know what it does. And that to me sent chills down my spine as I was reading it. Great stuff, you should really check it out for yourself. And I'm sure when the TV series catches up with the books, I'm going to have a great time watching that scene. And right now with season four of the TV series, humanity is just about going through the ring gates for the very first time. And in, De in December 2019, we will start discovering some of those artifacts. The story is picking up from book four, Cibola Burns. Now, sometimes because the story is so intriguing in this way of discovering alien artifacts, I find myself caring more about discovering the world that the authors had built over getting to know the plot points of the main characters. And sociological stories often have this problem where the sweeping tales of societal interactions are more important than the individual motivations of the characters. So the prose that goes into elaborating character development and character psychology often takes a back seat. But hey, if you like strong woman female characters, there are quite a few in Persepolis Rising. My favorite one in the novel was Bobby Draper, and in the TV show she's played by Miss Frankie Adams, who actually went to school not far from where I'm recording this in Auckland. She went to Auckland Girls Grammar School near Western Park, where I sometimes go to exercise in the evenings. Yeah, she's Maori, she's Pacific, and she plays the ex-Martian Marine, and she's a badass in the TV show and in the book, but in she really comes into her own in this story. This is pretty much her show. She's the one trying to hold the Rossi crew together. And there's also Kamina Drummer, who's this badass Belta captain and she's and she plays a really important role in this book but unlike the TV series where she's had a marginal leadership role as Fred Johnson's right-hand woman and as the representative the leader to represent the belters as they go through the ring gates in this novel she's pretty much like a head of state uh, the leader of a major factional organization called the transport union and she's like supposed to be made as the successor to Christian Avasarala. And I hope to read more of Kamina Drummer in the next few novels because she's always really fun to read about. Uh, for the uninitiated out there to the novels or the TV show, Christian Avasarala is a character to be reckoned with. She's this badass seasoned stateswoman Machiavellian politician character referred to as the old dame of the solar system. She's even more badass than Kamina Drummer. She says the F word a lot in the books, but a lot less so in the TV show. Now, uh, on a closing note, I'd like to say that if you haven't read the previous Expanse novels, that's okay. They're all pretty thick books, all of them, which can be quite intimidating. They, they may appear 
to be quite intimidating. Persepolis Rising comes in at more than 500, 600 pages. And, but since the story takes place after a 30-year time jump, the stage has been sort of reset. And I didn't have too much trouble relating to the references of the past books. There are some references like to the Free Navy and Marcos Inaros and that kind of stuff, which I have no idea what was about, what any of those were about. The characters, the crew of the Rocinante, that, that's the main cast of characters, have all aged and they're all about to move on. I mean, Alex is freaking balding. <laughs> yeah, which was funny. But Amos is still pretty psychopathic, has his psychopathic tendencies. Uh, Captain Holden and Naomi Nagata are all about to move on to the next phase of their lives. And then suddenly all hell breaks loose on this place where they're at called Medina Station, which is actually just the OPA as behemoth and um, the Nauvoo becomes the main hub ship. It's like the central hub of the ring network. It's an O'Neill cylinder that was once the mega battleship behemoth and before that it was supposed to send Mormon colonists on a journey to a distant star which is pretty awesome. So the crew of the Rocinante are about to go their separate ways. They're all about to retire when suddenly all hell breaks loose calling them together for one final confrontation with destiny that will alter the fate of mankind forever. And this book, along with the next three final books in the Expanse series, in my opinion, is the ending arc of the Expanse story. It ushers in the final twilight battle for the crew of the Rocinante and marks the beginning of the end for the entire Expanse series. So it's okay to start at this point if you want to know how it ends. Persepolis Rising takes you on the gravity-defying ascent of one final ride. And oh, what a ride it is. That's all for me. Like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and if you'd like to be notified for more content from me. Thanks for watching. I recommend you guys to go out there, watch The Expanse, read The Expanse. Next up, I will be reviewing Chixin Liu's Death's End, the third book of the Three Body Problem series. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Boop! I highly recommend this book if you just want to get into the Expanse and you have some knowledge of the background and want to read an Expanse book. I never thought I'd read one of the Expanse books. I had fingered through them at the bookstore, and I thought, oh, this is just too much of an investment. But I, re I ended up doing it, and I'm glad that I did. I might even make a video to talk more about pulsar wind nebulas, also known as Plarions, because they're quite interesting too.